Good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies slightly for the late start on my part, but I'd like to start by saying a big thank you for everyone that's joining us on a lovely and very sunny, if you're in London, Thursday afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Saskia Perriado. I'm a policy advisor at the BPS, and I'm currently leading on the BPS's Psychological Government Program, which you can find out more about on the BPS website or by getting in touch directly with the policy team at publicaffairs at bps.org. Um, I'm conscious that today's conversation is likely much more timely than it was when we first organized it, given the goings on in Westminster this week, um, indeed in the past few months. But this afternoon, we will be looking at three main strands, if the time permits, over the next hour or so, which are why do policies fail and can bring people into policy making process help? If so, how can it be done practically? How might psychology help as a conduit towards inclusive and people-centered policymaking? And what practical models and evidence that are currently in existence in the evidence base can we look towards? And lastly, um, as we explore these ideas and these models, how can we keep in mind questions of identity and equity, such as which people are we hearing from and which perspectives do we consider as we go about designing policy? Um, before we begin the conversation, a few logistic related points. I'm very glad to not have to say, I'm very glad to not have to go through the usual fire alarm drill that most of live events have. But if you would like to tweet about this lecture or continue the conversation online, we will be using hashtag PsychGov to track the conversation. We will also be picking up on questions from the audience throughout the session. And we're keen to bring as many of you as possible in. So do so please either through Twitter or on the Q&A function below, which my co-moderator, George, will be keeping an eye out for um, throughout the conversation. So with that being said, I'm delighted that we will be hearing from Matthew Taylor, who is the chief executive of the RSA. While the RSA has a wide program of work, which I strongly urge our audience to explore further, there are a few pieces of work, including the Campaign for Deliberate Democracy, which are especially relevant to our conversation today. Prior to the RSA, Matthew was director at the Institute for Public Policy Research. He then became chief advisor on political strategy to the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair. We're also joined by Catherine Scott, who is Director of Policy at the BPS. Um, she is responsible for leading on the BPS's work on taking psychological evidence into the heart of government in order to secure lasting change in public policy. And last but not least, we have John Amechi, who is Founder and Chief Executive of APS. Um, John is also an elected fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health and a research fellow at the University of East London. He also currently holds various board and trustee positions, um, including, I'm very glad to say, being a member of the steering group for our psychological government program. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Um, so I'm keen, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, I'm very keen to get into the practicalities of people-centered policymaking. But before we do so, I was hoping to lean on Matthew. Um, especially because your 2016 lecture on why policy fails and how it might succeed is something which I continuously go back to. I think I revisit that lecture a couple times every year, to be quite frank. Um, and I would strongly recommend our viewers look it up later down the line. But at the time, you were referring to UBI specifically, but there's one passage that I was hoping you could push forward a bit more, and that was in context of UBI, you mentioned that we need to avoid the temptation of talking to ourselves. We need to engage with what people actually think, not what we would like them to think. So as a starting point, I was hoping you could start us off with why, given your past experience using policy and having seen policy succeed, but also policy fail, you actually made a point of actually looking at people-centered policy. Well, thank you, Saskia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, this will be a fascinating hour for me because uh, I, I don't have a kind of fixed view of the overall question that you're wanting to ask. Um, and to say that I'm ambivalent about the use of psychology in policymaking um, is, 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 is to put it 
underestimate it really. I, I think that I think that psychological insight and awareness is really important, but I think an over reliance on simplistic individualistic psychological models uh, can be highly problematic actually but that's for later in the conversation i'm sure um what i'll do in my kind of five minutes just to kick us off saskia because um what's going to make it interesting is going to be the conversation that we have i think is just to reprise really that argument i made in 2016. Um, so what i argued in that lecture having spent most of my adult life in one way or another in the domain of policy making as a insider think tanker political party operative campaigner uh, even local councillor uh, was that generally speaking policy doesn't achieve the objectives that are set uh, for it um, sometimes um, policy goes catastrophically uh, wrong um, you know, think of the poll tax uh, or PFI or um, various other kinds of initiatives that have really rebounded very badly. But, but that's actually the exception. The more common problem is that policy does have an impact, but it has an impact which is short lived. It, it, it has an impact while um, something is being prioritized while extra investment is being made while the focus of politicians and the media is on a topic you get some impact uh, but once the attention moves the priorities shift the funding dries up then things revert to how they were before and nobody when they on when they unveil a policy social policy in particular nobody says that we're doing this policy fully aware of the fact that it'll only have a very short-term effect and things will go back to how they were they unveil policies on the basis that they can make a long-lasting systemic change and, and using that, that criterion, policy overwhelmingly fails. So why does policy fail? And there are lots of trivial reasons why policy fails, that politicians are lazy or they're responding to the headlines or they are kowtowing to the internal interests of people in their party uh, or they've become hopelessly obsessed by a single kind of demonic figure, and not that I'm naming names. Um, uh, but there are two non-trivial reasons uh, why policy fails, in my view. The first is that um, policy tends to be, in various ways, kind of scattergun. That is to say, policy seeks to influence complex systems, um, in, 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 and those systems have in, huge levels of interdependency within them. And policy tries to affect one or more variables within that system. And what it's incapable of doing is predicting how that intervention is going to spark all sorts of unexpected, unpredicted, sometimes counterproductive effects in other parts of the system, or that the system will simply swallow up the effect of the policy. It will simply become diffused across the system. So the first problem is that kind of scattergun uh, element of policy. And you see that particularly, I would say, in public services, where public services in this country have been subjected to almost constant reform for 35 years. And arguably, and you know, this really isn't an excessive thing that uh, I, I'm about to say, but arguably, had we 35 years ago simply said to local authorities, you can make your own decisions, respond to local voters, do things how you want to do it, but we'll rely on you to kind of learn from each other and not to do really stupid things for a long time. It, 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 almost certainly public services would be no less good than they are now and they'll probably be better. But we've had 35 years and billions and billions of pounds spent achieving very little, I would argue, overall. Um, the other non-trivial problem with policy is, is a, a forms of path dependency. Um, uh, and this isn't, by the way, just true of, of, of political policy, public policy, it's true of policy in organisations. It takes a long time to win a mandate to do something. So you've got an idea, you've got a strategy, it takes a long time to develop it, to win support for it, and finally you get the green light and you go ahead. And then as you start to implement, for the reasons, partly for the reasons I've just described, things don't go in the way that you want them to. Uh, and what you should be then doing is adapting the policy in real time, but most of our systems don't allow us to do that. Now one of the really interesting things about coronavirus is it has enabled government to actually adapt in real time. And that's quite interesting. So 
if you look at, for example, the small business support scheme, I think that's had four changes so far since it was unveiled. And in many ways, I think that's rather good, that kind of agility, that capacity to adapt. But it's unusual. Usually when we put things into legislation, we're stuck with them. So one form of path dependency is we persist with things when they're not working. But actually, there's another form of path dependency, which is that we do things. They don't really work. We start to improve them. We start to learn. And then after four or five years, when they're actually starting to work, the politicians have lost interest, lost patience, and they abandon the policy just at the point at which we might have started to get to the point at which it's actually starting to kind of embed itself and, and, and operate. So to conclude, what we argue for at the RSA in response to those two issues is an approach to policy making which we describe as thinking like a system and acting like an entrepreneur. So trying to understand problems systemically and of course human psychology is an incredibly important part of that system. You know attitudes, um, assumptions, meaning, belonging, all of those things are very important parts of the systems and one of the good things about system thinking is it tends to take seriously these kinds of issues like meaning, like belonging, uh, like social norms whereas often policy interventions don't really think seriously about those things or else they just make very lazy assumptions about them. Um, so thinking systemically on the one hand but on the other hand acting entrepreneurially and that phrase is in recognition of the need to be highly adaptive because the level of complexity and unknowability in human systems is much greater than policymakers like to imagine. And again, something we're witnessing in this crisis is that human reactions are not predictable and there's a high degree um, uh, of reflexivity in, in human behavior. So, you know, it's not that the government does something and then people do something, then people do something. It's that the government do some, does something, then people do something not quite what the government wanted. And then the government responds to the fact that people aren't quite doing what they wanted. And then people respond in a different way. And all sorts of things like expectations in play. I mean, you know, one of the really big challenges we have now, and I'll finish with this is, you know, if you loosen lockdown and people think it's a linear process, people will tend to get ahead of where, you, of where government policy is. Because if they think it's going to happen anyway, well, why would I wait? You know, so um, expectations are an important part of what sh shapes human behaviour. So yes, ultimately, the approach I'm advocating is one that would take human psychology um, more uh, seriously uh, than I think often traditional policymaking does. But I finish with what I said at the beginning. I, I also think we need to be very careful about reductive psychological um, approaches. And indeed, one of my kind of favorite subjects at the moment is derived from Rutger Bregman's book, Humankind. And I don't know if you've read Humankind, but if you read Humankind and you're you know, a psychologist, it's a pretty depressing read because basically you know, our attitudes to human behavior were very strongly influenced by some very dodgy social psychology, which, you know, had some massive ramifications. And, you know, we've blamed for the last 15 years neoclassical economics for many of our woes. It turns out the social psychology play, played a pretty big role as well. So we should, in, in, in as much as I want to bring psychology in, I want to be very wary of psychological reductionism. I think that's actually a wonderful intro. And actually, it sets up Catherine quite well because actually one of the key underpinnings we had from the very beginning of this program about a year ago was that the aim wasn't to just change policy, it was also to change the way policy is made, but also the evidence that's being reviewed to inform those policy decisions. And let's be clear, I'm sure John and Catherine will touch upon, um, not all evidence is equal. Um, so on that note, Catherine, um, how are you seeing the role of psychological evidence? Um, when it comes to people-centered policymaking? So there's a, a couple of points I wanna make and a couple of um, things I'd like to echo for, from what Matthew's just brought in. I think one of the really important points to make is around what, what we're trying to do with, with the, the program, the psychology of government program, is really look at you know, the Venn diagram of where policy and psychology overlap and really explore what's in that space, where there are, um, overlaps and, and interesting dynamics that we can get more into. And I think it's an area that's been 
quite um, overlooked in terms of what we've done at the BPS and it's something that, that it's fascinating and, and I think we can add a lot. But I think it's really important to kind of put that in context and be thinking about what's our position, what's our, you know, how do we bring a new piece to the jigsaw and how do we kind of contribute a different perspective. And I want to add another sort of set of reasons to, to the points that Matthew's made around why, why I think policies fail. And I think part of that is around not seeing a policy on a kind of human scale and about not thinking about the human at the heart of that policy making. And I think that's a, an element that that psychology can bring. I mean, one of my, the things that, so I'm a, a member of the scientific um, advisory group for behavioral science reporting into SAGE. And I think what's really fascinating is to see the kind of points that the psychologists are bringing to the table, which can quite often be really straightforward and things that can easily get overlooked. Like if you reopen the parks, where are people going to go to the toilet if you don't also reopen the toilets? And where are you going to get a cup of tea? And what is the kind of meaning involved in going to the park? And, and it's more than just, you know, a, a releasing of restrictions. It's about what does that mean for me and, and, and my, my life? And, and I think that's where having a psychologist in the room can quite often bring that perspective. And I think, you know, we, we think about relationships. So we think about, you know, if you are stopping households from seeing each other they're they're the ones thinking about well what if there's a you know a, a couple that's um you know living apart and it's those kind of questions that can quite easily get overseen if you're looking for these kind of black and white answers and that that sort of element of unknowability that that matthew mentioned i think that's something again that we really embrace as psychologists and i think that's something where you know that that complexity and uncertainty of of individual and you know social and group and community um, behavior and principles that's something that we're actually sort of trained to to sit with and to sort of accept and that's our starting point in a way that other disciplines don't have that complexity and unknowability as their starting point so we're looking to kind of build up from that and i think we're we're pretty good at seeing unintended consequences we're pretty good at seeing you know those places where stigma is created where issues around identity could be revealed and touched upon where you know just sort of relying on kind of economic models might might not do that for you so so that's something that that i think we're we're bringing to, to the party kind of thing and i think it's it's a little bit about thinking about you know how policy feels and that's again a, an area where as psychologists it's something we can we can embrace and be proud of as our discipline i mean you know we we have a, a history um and and that's something that we we're coming to terms with but i think that ability to sort of think about and talk about some like the emotional elements and and you know you see that played out in a, in a daily basis you know at the moment in terms of what's happening with the response to the pandemic you know fear trust all of these things are, are you know that they're, they're not something you can measure they're not something you can particularly model um although actually my, my other argument here would be that you know investing in different types of research and trying to answer different questions um could really help us in terms of improving policy outcomes and then i think finally that the other point to sort of mention is around the kind of frameworks of understanding that we that we have as psychologists that we can bring and that is around systems thinking it's around ecological models so thinking about an individual within the context of their family their community the roles of um you know social norms etc and and where the evidence doesn't exist we can we have a way in, in within psychology of kind of applying models of thinking and and thinking about how where there isn't an evidence base or where it's not strong enough or where it you know um needs to be developed in a certain way we have ways of kind of applying psychological models that can help to predict some of those unintended consequences and having that approach alongside some of the existing um ways of, of policy analysis i think we could only Im improve policy outcomes so i'll leave it there and hopefully we'll touch upon a bit more about the practical rather than just theoretical realities of how the interdisciplinary thinking falls into play because um, as I think Matthew and Catherine both touched upon, it's not psychology at the expense of everything. It's not prioritizing one discipline over others, but it's about 
making sure that there's a space for the right questions to be asked. And if they're not being asked for a space to actually allow for a bit of discursive analysis about what is the actual problem you're trying to solve or what is the question you're trying to ask before you go off and ask it and come up with an answer you probably did not expect. Um, so with that, I'm actually gonna turn over to John because we've actually had a few conversations specifically on people. Um, the people we hear, the people we engage with and policies are designed. Um, so I was hoping you could start us off on that, especially in the context of the new normal. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, I want to respond to Matthew. I think it's really important what he said about psychology uh, and, and its limits. And I think, Catherine, you, you, you know this from the meetings that we've had with our group so far, that I, I found that my colleagues and I have been um, collectively pursuing a way to define the limits of psychology's unique contribution to this, as opposed to saying, we can, we can, we have a unique solution in all these different places. So I've really been pleased that the approach has been that, not the other. I think the other part, and Catherine, you've talked about the psychology as a as a as a job that lives around the the pursuit of the unknown, the uh, the unknowability, and the nuance. And and I honestly think that some part of the usefulness of psychology here is is that we can provide an evidence base for the obvious, for for the clearly knowable ways that policy is going to have a negative impact on 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 populations that that is just or at least it should be obvious uh, i'm i'm interested in this people getting people involved because uh, i always ask the question i've asked this of both saskia and, and catherine both i mean who's the people we're talking about because when i look at how policy is made very often it doesn't feel like it's made for me uh, or with me in mind, or for certain types of people. It's made for certain types of voters and certain types of constituencies. And this might be uncharitable, but to me at this point, it would be, it's really reasonable and rational for people to be disengaged from the policymaking process. Uh, I think that the disengagement of people is, is more intentional and systemic than it is a, a function of individual apathy. Uh, uh, I don't think the policymaking system is broken, and I do hear people say that. I think it's delivering exactly what it was designed to deliver. It may be a Rube Goldberg machine at this stage, um, but it's delivering exactly what it's meant to. And some of the conversations that we've had about policy, really, it, it shows some of the unique ways that would turn people off. Right? The idea that when you talk amongst the civil servants, when you talk amongst some of the more obscure policymakers, they're usually invisible members of it, like special advisors, again, usually invisible, um, like lobbyists. We can see that many of these people, civil servants who are in that three year rotation to make their mark, and then they're gonna be dished off somewhere else if they're gonna have a career. They see um, policy as, as, an in, as a societally inert project that goes on their CV. So when we talk about people, uh, they don't, we're not thinking about people. We're saying this is a project to be completed. It will take, as Matthew alluded to, a number of years to get it through a process, greenlit to a stage, and then actually delivered. And for some of the members of that people, there's, it's just a project that's going to go on their CV. If people are considered at all, it's, it's, um, it, it's a focus group demographic of people who, who are likely to, to make a good box pop. I think when you look at the people who are involved in policy making, it's a deeply homogenous and mostly invisible group of people who, who, and it's not a question of some proactive lack of caring or empathy, but if you do look at policy as an inert project, something that won't be responsible. And indeed, when you look at the policy making process, the utter lack of accountability that comes through it, in part because of the, the churn throughout the civil service, the moving on from a post, in part because of the bureaucracy, that, that Rube Goldberg machine of, of bureaucracy, it, it, in part because of the presence of so many unseen partners who contribute to it and indeed deliver it. You think of universal credit, which is you know, substantively the product of, of a think tank, then it's not hard to see how people would be in disengaged. And, for me, when I look at the people part of this, to get people involved, good policy, like good research, needs to have 
the fewest possible number of assumptions to make it work. And as you look at policy now, it has so many assumptions. It relies on this kind of unif uh, uniformly informed and consistent, uh, conscientious good actors who are going to implement it. And we know that's not what happens. Uh, it relies on this consistent interpretation by those good actors. And we know that doesn't happen. It requires that the context of the application, the people who it's going to apply to, it'll have equal impact on everybody. And, and I think there is a, a kind of, for me, rather naive idea that most policy is designed to do something with the idea that it can and will do something. And I don't think all policy is designed that way. I think a lot of policy, especially social policy, is designed to be seen doing something. And so you can look at the broken, the way that, for example, the city of New York and, and Giuliani took the psychological concepts of the broken window and turned it into a way to harass minority communities for a decade. The way that you look at stop and search in, our, in, in the UK now doesn't actually show that it drops, does anything for crime, but it does prove that something is being done about criminality. And I think if you want people to be involved, you have to give them a reason to be involved. And I love the idea of deliberative democracy, but what scares me is some of the criteria even for that. We require an informed electorate. We, we, we require a mechanism for people to be involved that still has the gravity of evidence around it. And it requires that we have an opportunity for people to participate substantively, but also that we have to shut down misinformation channels. Because I look at this, and Saskia, you and I talked about this the other day, I worry what, hap what would happen right now if we had a, a referendum on climate change. Because I'm just not sure that if you got people involved at this stage with the amount of nonsense there is out there, a referendum on vaccination, even in the, amidst this COVID crisis. I'm not sure which side the pendulum swings on that. And I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that deliberative democracy is supposed to deliver on all of those fronts. But to me, I want to get people involved, but I think we have to stop pretending that the machine is broken and rather than delivering pretty much what it's supposed to for a lot of people. On that note, I'm going to bring in Catherine first, but then I'd be keen to bring Matthew back in as well to start the conversation off. Catherine. Just wanted to sort of pick up on that question of who into when we're talking about people. And I think one of the things we need to kind of get past is that, you know, people have, and I think this is something that, you know, if you think about what happens with the kind of behavioral economists and, and how we had this thing of, you know, everybody in economics assumes that people are rational actors and they will all behave one way. And then behavioral economics came along and said, well, no, that's not actually what happens. People are predictably irrational. But then I think there's another element to that where we say, well, they're not predictably irrational. They're not predictably anything. And I think, you know, there's an element of saying that, you know, depending on where I am, and I've reflected on this myself, you know, particularly around, you know, how I think I would have reacted depending on different policies that have been introduced over the last sort of, you know, 10 weeks. And I think there's an element of thinking, well, depending on where I am and, and what role I'm playing and what day it is and, you know, whether I've just watched something on TV that's annoyed me, then, you know, then my decisions would be different. And I think that's where you know, we start from a position of saying there's very little that you can know for definite, but that's where we should start. And I think that's where, you know, when we're talking about referendum is a very blunt tool for kind of involving people in, a, um, in deliberative democracy. And I think that's where, again, where I see a strength for psychology, because we're trained to listen in various different ways, whether that's as a, you know, as a one-on-one -on -one clinical psychologist thinking about about that and I think you know a clinical psychologist starts from that that perception of that that deep understanding of people can be very different on different days and depending you know on, on how they are right up to kind of where we are with research and, and depending on group level research community level research you know and and that's something that we are you know and one of our kind of taglines for a psychological government program is about embrace the uncertainty and I think that's something where we can bring a strength to some of this stuff by saying, well, the people involved are, are people and people are inherently complex and unknowable, so. I'll bring it back to Matthew, because we've, we've started off with your concept. You've set up a good, we're all in agreement about 
policies can fail and, and about the general trends or factors that often are inherent to policies that end up failing. But I'm wondering if it's possible to dig a bit deeper into, unless you want to refer to one of the points John and Catherine um, brought, in which case please do, but bring a bit more about the idea of the individual approach that you see with psychology. Because I think one thing that's coming out of both Catherine and John is actually the more systemic approach to how psychology can be used and implemented and supplemented on a, on a systems-based approach to what you mentioned rather than just an individual experience one. Um, yeah, well, um, I, I suppose in, in a way, the, the point is not, my, my worry about psychology is that the, the closer psychology is to sociology and indeed uh, economics and philosophy, the, the more it's part, you know, I, I want psychology to be part of the mix, but I'm worried when psychology generates bits of truth, which, which, which are posited as kind of somehow standing outside other ways of understanding how human beings behave. And that's what I mean by reductionism, right? So, um, and I, uh, by the way, I acknowledge, um, you know, I agree with everything that Catherine said, and I very much acknowledge John's points about the fact that there's a naivety in suggesting that what policy is always trying to do is to make the world a better place. There are all sorts of other motivations for policy. And I, I said at the outset that policy fails for trivial reasons. And one of the trivial reasons that policy fails is that it was never really about making the world a better place. It was about, you know, mollifying the Daily Mail or party activists or whatever it, it might be. And I, I, I fully acknowledge that. Um, but I think it might be useful, Saskia, because to, to, to kind of come at this another angle and, and, and to bring in a deliberation. So actually, one of the concepts that I would want to bring from psychology into politics is the notion of a psychodynamic relationship between leaders and led. Uh, in the sense that I think that what good politics is about is a process which is in some ways akin to good um, therapy. Uh, so I once had a therapist describe to me the difference between kind of bad therapy and good therapy from their perspective. And they said that bad therapy was about telling you, giving you certainties, whereas good therapy was about dismantling your certainties. Um, that bad therapy was about telling you that you could divide the world up into kind of good things and bad things and truth and falsehood. Um, but good therapy was about getting you to understand that the world was unpredictable and in many ways unfair, but you had to kind of make the best of it to kind of accept, you know, the, the nature of the world and to get on with it and to live with it as best that you could. And I think that politics, good politics and bad politics can be distinguished in a similar kind of way. The reason populism is so pernicious is because like bad therapy, it's trying to tell you that the world is a simple thing and that if you could only grasp a couple of critical truths about who, whose side you should be on and whose side you should be against, then everything would be fine. Good political leaders are the ones that find ways of getting people to understand why things are difficult, getting people to own that things are difficult, getting people to be patient about the fact that it can take time to make change happen, getting people beyond the stage of blaming other people for what is happening uh, in their lives. And none of that is to, by the way, put aside the importance of, of anger, the importance of, um, uh, of resistance, of, of, uh, of struggle, um, but it is to say that, that in a country, in a democracy, the psychodynamics of politics is often about getting citizens away from their initial instincts and into a more thoughtful position. And that's what deliberation is about for me. So uh, the great things about deliberation are firstly that it addresses John's point about who's in the room because deliberative methodologies require that you have a genuine cross-section of the population. So, you know, you genuinely have in the room young and old and uh, uh, p people from all different backgrounds in terms of ethnicity and in terms of place and also in terms of political starting points. So it's a genuine cross-section. You don't get that. There's no 
I'll, there's no way of getting a genuine cross-section of people's views um, than to use some kind of proper sampling methodology. And then secondly, the, that, so that's the first thing, it, it brings the, 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 the community, the public into the room in a way that representative politics, I'm afraid, does not. But then secondly, it has this kind of psychodynamic quality in that people go on a journey in through deliberation. And, you know, it is fascinating for me that one of the very consistent parts of deliberation is that people start off thinking the world is simple, but that they are not capable of exercising agency. And they, at the end, they tend to think the world is more complicated, but they have an enhanced sense of their own agency, their own possibility, the way in which they are connected to the thing that they have been discussing. And of course, you know, public opinion is a meaningless concept because we know from deliberation that, that, that where people stand on an issue when they've had time to think about it, hear a range of opinions and talk to other people respectfully about it, very often is a long way away from where their first instincts are if they're asked in an opinion poll, you know, much less asked to vote for the candidate who they most like in an election every five years. So I think that the deliberation is a psychologically robust methodology and that's why I favor it but it's a very very particular thing you know one of the problems of deliberation is that it's a term which people don't understand and they use it to describe all sorts of things when I use it I'm using it to describe something very very specific which is a process of bringing together a representative sample of the population for an in-depth properly meet, properly moderated conversation about a set of issues in order that they generate recommendations which are then passed on to decision makers. It's not consultation, it's not opinion polling, it's not focus groups, it's something much more robust than that. And as I say, it is something which I think is psychologically robust. I'd like to actually bring in John, especially because you have done a lot of work on organizational leadership, which does seem to have some especially because of organizational culture, which seems to mirror in a way what Matthew is bringing up when it comes to the process of deliberation. So I'm hoping you can touch upon that a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've seen your speech and, and read some of the stuff on the RSS website. I, I really like the idea of deliberative democracy. My, my problem is that it, when I look at a rubber meets the road analysis of this, I'm interested in like uh, the thing that I was supposed to talk about before, the new normal is, is a term I hate because to me it speaks of, whether you're talking about a political system, uh, democracy, whatever it is, it speaks of, uh, certainly in terms of the business sense, most of the clients that we're working with, exactly the same as it used to be, plus or minus one or two prophylactic or ameliorating uh, uh, things that we need to get over this specific virus. So not over pandemics, not over big system-wide challenges, but this specific thing. And I think it's deeply unsatisfying to set a future strategy on that basis, of course. So this, to me, is the kind of cultural clean slate, which is what we think would, my organization advocates, that, that, that I think would be really intriguing. The problem is that even as I look at therapy, I started off in marriage and family therapy, which is probably terrifying for most people to imagine, but I know that not all psychologists are automatically with, with qualification become the kind that we, we, we'd hope for. But when I compare therapists, in, in my experience, I, my, I went to university in America, with politicians, there are some elements there that I do think are reasonably consistent. The idea of, of a level of expertise, a, a plausible framework for operating that is shared with the person that they're having the conversation with across the table. There's the idea that you are not just well-intentioned, but ethically bound in a way that has true and real consequences and then the last part which i think is the most important and i hold to this to this day to the detriment of my organization is the fact and this is a fundamental difference between politics and psychology my job is to become redundant it is my, my it is not my job to maintain my position forever if i'm coaching somebody if i'm in therapy with somebody if i'm helping an organization through the same challenge for 6 years it's great for the retainer it's not great for the organization i'm either not imparting the right things or i'm not doing my job but politicians entire raison d'etre is to maintain their position and i think that means they're fundamentally ill equipped to be the kind of facilitators of a system that you're talking about, even though, and I cannot stress this enough, 
I am 100% behind a system like this because I believe it to have more chance than uh, uh, changing the democracy itself, proportional representation or something like that. I just think that there are actors who are not so good in this system who realize that they and the people who will maintain their power base and their retainer are the ones that they will service. Because I look now in terms of policy and Grenfell Tower, who we have right now today people who have still not been permanently rehoused after that. So not only are people aware that a policy that existed to protect them was abandoned, we're also, they're also aware of the fact that even when they are victims of that policy that was ill thought through, they still find themselves victims perpetually at, in a story that's now not interesting. And then no wonder people like that say, what's the point? I've yelled in front of the TV cameras. I've protested at Parliament. What else can I do? I'm going to bring it back to Matthew quickly, because again, there's been some, and then I'd like to go to Catherine, especially because I know of the work you've done on poverty to flourishing. You've done quite a lot of work on agency and on embracing complexity, which might add something to the conversation here. So first Matthew and then Catherine. Yeah, I mean, look, John's right to get us to ask about the motives and interests of people in the system. That is part, I think, of understanding any system. And, um, and he's right that, that a lot of politicians don't like deliberation because they feel threatened by it. Uh, interestingly, also, journalists hate deliberation, which is something that I've really been kind of interested by. Um, and the reason journalists hate deliberation is that journalists have to believe that they are necessary to mediate between power and people. And a process which demonstrates that ordinary people are perfectly capable of understanding quite complex issues and coming to quite sophisticated views is threatening to them. And also a process which involves people sitting around a table, discussing something amicably and learning from each other and enjoying each other's company and calling that democracy um, is much, much less interesting than two people yelling at each other across a dispatch box, whether or not it's real or virtual. Um, and I think one of the most contemptible things I've heard in the recent years, actually, involved a very well-known political journalist, very intelligent woman. And I was on a program with her talking about deliberation. At the end, I said to her, why is it that you report deliberation so little? There have been some really interesting experiments. And, um, and she said to me, well, it's simple, Matthew. It's boring. You know, and, and I thought, you know, right, okay. <laughs> So that's the level of your ethical commitment. Even if I can persuade you this thing really works, that it, it, it can actually restore people's faith in democracy, it can lead to great decisions, you're not going to do it because it's just a bit tedious. Um, and interestingly, you know, Channel 4 a few years ago commissioned a deliberative process and they then cancelled it because it was boring. Because, you know, it wasn't like Big Brother. People didn't, you know, scream at each other and punch each other, you know, and, you know, watching people having a civilized and interesting conversation is a bit tedious, to be honest. So, you know, as I'm sure it was pretty tedious in the Greek, in Athens, you know, not, um, notwithstanding the fact we're talking here about white men, but it was pretty tedious there when they stood in the square and discussed things for eight hours, you know, that's kind of how it is. So um, I, I just want to say, I, I kind of completely, you know, uh, get, um, uh, 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 all of that. But I still think that the deliberation, if it was done regularly, if it was done as a routine part of how we do things, not displacing representative democracy, but guiding representative democracy, it could teach people something really important. And the thing it could teach people is that how you will think about something when you've had time to think about it and talk to other people about it may not be the same as the gut instinct you've got. And, you know, if every single human being just had the awareness that how they think about something might change if they had time to delve into it and talk to other people about it and to try to work out something, you know, our political culture would be so much better if that simple thing was understood by people. And the, and the, the irony is, and my final point, the irony is we do know that because one of the few institutions in our country that hasn't really come under any sustained attack is the jury. You know, and that's weird in a way because juries are 
bloody, I mean, they're really strange things. You know, here's somebody, a life and death decision is going to be made about this person. We're going to haul 12 people, random people off the street, stick them in an overheated room with horrible sandwiches, have two people who are paid to, to have a position, whether or not it's true, in order, and, and, you know, the la all of that kind of stuff. So I've been on a jury. I mean, it's, it's pretty limited in all sorts of ways, but yet it works. And the reason it works is very simple. Because we say, well, had I listened to all the evidence, I would have come to the same opinion. We just trust that. We trust that simple idea, had I heard all the evidence, I would have come to the same conclusion. And that is in stark contrast to what we think about pol politics, because we don't ever think about politicians, and sometimes we're being unfair when we don't think this. We don't think the politicians are listened to it, come to a decision, and we go, well, I'm sure if I'd listened to all the evidence like the politicians, then I would have come to the same decision. Very few people think that, yeah? And, that, and for reasons that John's described, they're pretty right to th not to think that. So the point about deliberation is not, you know, one of the most boring, uh, lazy critics, critics of crit criticisms of deliberation is, well, how do we get millions of people involved? In you don't need millions of people. You just need a representative group and for other citizens to watch it, to see it, and to put themselves in the shoes of those people and think, all oh, right, okay, that's interesting. So it is a bit more complicated. So it is possible to reach agreement. So yes, maybe we do have to make some sacrifices in the long-term interests of the planet or the nation or whatever. Before I go to Catherine and then John, um, I do want to say actually the jury analogy is a really good one, if only because one of the key foundation of a good jury is it has to be a jury of your peers. Because a lot of court decisions, a lot of sentences have been overturned precisely because the jury wasn't representational. So it actually does play quite nicely. Um, Catherine, I know deliberation, probably not in the same framework that Matthew has been talking about, but has been at least that space for conversation, especially involving experts by experience, has been a huge part of the poverty to flourishing campaign you're doing this year. Yeah, so we asked our members last year what they wanted us to focus on um, in terms of our policy work for 2020 and before, so obviously before COVID. Um, and they, they chose poverty to flourishing as, as the campaign um, for us to look at. And I think one of the, the really key elements that's come out of the discussions we've had so far has been around this sense of, of agency and thinking about what that means in terms of policy making and how can we think about policies you know some policies give you agency and, and some policies take it away and it, there's something about trying to understand where the, the humans are in in that equation and so for us that you know there, there is this sense of you know, when, when Matthew talks about this kind of process of getting people involved and, and, you know, we think about models like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a flawed model and it, you know, is not based on a hugely diverse sample of people when it was developed, but there's something kind of fundamental about that model, which says that, you know, if, if you are in a position where you're, you know, struggling to put a roof over your head, that actually starting to think about some of these other issues can be really difficult, you know, in terms of the, the, the way, you know, there's, there's been members of our poverty to, to British expert reference group are studying the kind of cognitive uh, decision making you know in in um for people who are in socioeconomic difficulty and i think for me it's about that sense of you know the, the time and the bandwidth is such an important part of that and i think there's so much that needs to be done in terms of you know sort of bringing people in in a way that feels right to them that makes them feel like they do have that that agency and that they can be involved and I think you know some of the the models that you're you're talking about I'm just reflecting on you know I got a, a letter from my local council um you know saying where should you know where tick these boxes for where you think I should spend the budget you know where should the mayor of um I'll not tell you where I live but <laughs> where should I spend the, the budget for next year and my first thought was well that's your job you know and and I haven't got the time to sit and tell you how to you know and I think there's something about that balance where you know where people are in this um situation of of trying to to find ways to become more involved but also at the same time responding to to their own sort of immediate needs is, is a balance that we have to get right and think about how we do that and, and overcome some of those practicalities but at the same time i think you know the, the points you were making about when people do come in and and start to sort of talk to their peers and, and check you know it's that it's that treating people like grown-ups you know is is such an important part of this and, and that's something that we've seen 
you know, over the last few weeks in terms of some of the communication and some of the ways that the policies that have come out around the pandemic have really, you know, not communicated that level of uncertainty around where we are with the evidence base because of almost a position of thinking, well, you know, the public won't know what to do if we don't, you know, and actually what, what we've shown in the, in the pandemic is, is coming together in, in collective action and actually, you know, people are taking the pro-social route most of the time. And, and I think that's something about that sense of agency in terms of incorporating those elements and, and really meeting people where they are with some of this. I know John wanted to come in and then I do have a few questions to go through the audience with. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, uh, I think Matthew's right. I think people would get involved. I, I'm not one of these people who thinks that people aren't, aren't keen on it, but I just think there are implications here. And, and when I look at it, it's things like, you know, when you talk about juries, the composition is so important. And when you look at uh, what could be a representative uh, group of people for this kind of deliberative process, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been the only black face in a room, which is entirely representative of, I, I live in Covent Garden, of where I live, uh, if not a little over-representative. Um, but it does mean that there is perspective. I'm always that guy. It's my job. It creates this unending pressure for me to speak on behalf of a group of people, which is ridiculous. But it also conflates me with somebody else who might look like me, but probably doesn't have my same experience. And I think there's a, there's a form of representative here that isn't just about do we have the right percentage of people, but are the people who are most, and you said this at the beginning, Saskia, most 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 going to bear the burden of the policy in question is their voice proportionately represented based on the burden they will face uh, and i think that's a really important part the other thing is that whilst i think people will get involved and we need to treat people like grown-ups i don't think our educational system the the way that the media reports stuff as matthew uh, alluded to none of these things prepares people for the kind of conversation that that is deliberative that that prepares people for the self-regulation, all the other elements of this that are required when worldviews become challenged, when ideas that are roundly considered to be absolutely right are, are, are exposed or, or have holes poked in them by reasoned arguments. And I think educational system, the composition of the room, all of these things are so important. And then the idea that people know that what they've deliberated will impact policy because nothing is more frustrating as we've seen with numerous referenda than people feeling like their views are not represented in the policy that's produced. So I'm going to jump in here because one of the key themes that's emerging across I would say a lot of conversations that are happening right now throughout this pandemic is actually public trust and how do we reconnect and re-engage public from a trust and from an accountability perspective with policy, which is often seen even by people who live in the bubble, and I will unapologetically say I am very much in the bubble, it's often very abstract. It's often the same group of people, the same conversation happening from Westminster. How do we go through creating a level of support for policy when it's contingent on trust? And one thing which I would like to go back to Matthew on is actually the way you talk about deliberative democracy is it's, it's, there's a process. There are clear check marks. I think from what I've read from your case studies, you're also tracking not just the response and feedback and engagement from the people involved in the process. You're also, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a case with Andy Burnham in Manchester where you actually looked at his level of engagement from the beginning of the process to the middle of the process. So before I, I go to Matthew, I also want to say that the democracy is a model I actually quite like, in theory. Um, it's also not the only model out there because there's also something which is called restorative justice. And that's just to go back to John's point. Um, this is something to a lot of Aboriginals. I'm half Canadian, so we're quite familiar with that over there. From a cultural perspective is that many people know the words restorative justice. Not many people understand what it means until they've had to go through it themselves. Yet nonetheless, there's a level of understanding of the process which is a critical component of making the actual decision verdict reach through restorative justice a foundation. Like you have to go through the training as you go through the process in order to get to an outcome. So that expanded step of training is embedded. I'm wondering, and I know I brought up restorative justice, but I'm wondering if that's the kind of thing 
that you also are bringing forward as you start testing out this model for deliberative justice, sorry, deliberative democracy in practice? Yeah, I mean, look, to, 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 to draw some, some threads together or to try to draw some threads together. You know, I mean, if you look at the inglorious history of, so, of, of social psychology, American social psychology, in helping to generate an account of human motivation and human nature, which was entirely erroneous and very reactionary, um, part of the reason for that is just sheer fraud and ego, for example, in the case of Philip Zimbardo and the Stanford Prison Experiment. But part of it, you know, maybe with Stanley Milgram, for example, and other bits of social psychology, is that what has been demonstrated is the response of a certain group of people to a very particular, very abstract set of uh, experiments. And from that is derived a huge theory about human nature when all that really should be derived from it is that a small, small number of people in a particular circumstance respond to a very contrived set of arrangements in a particular way yeah now one of the points about deliberation and one of the points about restorative justice is the recognition that human beings are not a fixed point which can somehow be disclosed through an experiment which says, well, because people react in this way, in this setting, this is who they are, but recognizes that human beings are complex and that they change and that they change through processes of reflection and engagement with other people and experiences in life. And, you know, I think that the, 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 what has happened is that I think, so one way of describing this, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief, but one of the ways of describing this is that when po politics used to be more deferential, and there were all sorts of problems of deferential politics, particularly because it was dominated by white, middle-aged, middle -aged, middle-class men, right? But in a way, the strength of deferential politics was that the people who did politics could kind of deal with all this complexity, and then a decision would come churning out, and the people would kind of accept that decision because they trusted the Labour Party or they trusted the Conservative Party, and they didn't kind of pull away at everything, and the journalists were more respectful, right? Now, that's all sorts of problems in that world. I don't want to go back to that world, but in a sense, you could, you could deal with complexity then because it happened within the elite, and then they, they passed that decision, and people didn't question it as much as they now do. What we have now is much healthier in some ways, which is we're much more skeptical, much more questioning. We have 24 hour news. There is no kind of political elite. I mean, you know, there is a political elite, but the idea that politicians can kind of make a decision and not have to be accountable, not have to offer an account, not themselves be subject to scrutiny, that's all kind of gone. And actually being a politician is a really miserable existence, which is actually a separate kind of problem. But, but the difficulty is that we've created this kind of environment where politicians, uh, have to constantly account for themselves. But yet we've done it using incredibly simplistic accounts of human beings. So, so we, 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 politicians have to give an account, but the account that they give is a kind of lowest common denominator account. And that's what populism is, basically. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we have to have processes which allow politicians to be more emotionally intelligent. You know, and, and, you know, for me, the thing about deliberation in the end, I'm not, I'm not going to go back, back about deliberation, but the, the point about deliberation and restorative justice is at the end of it, you are able to say, look, we're going to do something which you might not have agreed with at the beginning, but you've been through a process and now you've come to a different position. And this new position, based upon thought, based upon reflection, based upon interaction, is probably a better position than the position you had at the beginning, which was based upon a kind of knee-jerk because you're very busy and you've got other things in your life to think about. Now, that idea, that idea that, that considered thought is probably more valuable than unconsidered thought is deeply, deeply unpopular. You know, I, I, you know, I have the misfortune to spend quite a lot of time with Claire Fox. And I want to say, you know, on a personal level, I like Claire Fox. She's a generous and nice person. But politically... I find her abhorrent. And the reason I find her abhorrent is that she systematically and deliberately caricatures the idea 
that people can go on an intellectual journey when they know more about something, when they reflect on something, when they talk to people about something. She caricatures that over and over again, deliberately as a kind of conspiratorial elitism, rather than a simple truth about human beings, right? And so, you know, this is the kind of bind we're in at the moment. And that, again, is why the common characteristic between restorative justice and liberative democracy is the notion that human beings go on a journey and end up in a position different to the position they started on, which, of course, is, you know, a, a very basic psychological insight, but one which we seem now to be missing from our political discourse. I'm sure Catherine would agree, especially given her experience um, actually working with government. But I'm going to quickly bring John in and then Catherine and then we will go on. Yeah, I'm, I think the, the trust element that, that Catherine brought up and Matthew you referred to is really important. When you said we, we need to allow some emotional intelligence in our politicians, the, the thing for me is that I always, and it's controversial I'm sure, but I always prefer emotional literacy simply because I think emotional intelligence fools people into the idea that either you've got it or you don't. And, and, and it allows people to believe that, well, what can we possibly do? We have to wait until a generation of emotionally illiterate uh, politicians dies. And, and I don't think we, need to, we should have to wait for them to, to, to pass on. We should demand that they have the education that is available out there and forget through psychology. There's a million different means and that they probably apply in other contexts of their life with their, with their grandchild or their nieces or their partners. And so to me, there's a choice element of this, of the lack of emotional literacy that exists in politics is the one side. The other thing is, I think we have to be really careful because I, I'm with you on this 24 hour news cycle. I find it, uh, you know, talk about reductive, what happens there. But I think there is a real difference between constant observation and scrutiny. I think there's a real difference between scrutiny and accountability. Yeah. And I think that's where we, we need accountability because that's the thing that gives me confidence that an unintended consequence of this policy has not come on purpose. Whereas I've got to tell you, and, and again, this on an individual basis and not really a scientific or psychological basis, on a daily basis, I feel like this policy or that policy is designed to do what it's doing to people. And that can't be, amel that can't be ameliorated by the fact that we see them a lot on College Green or we watch them being harried uh, between their car and their house. I think the actual accountability element, the accountability of civil services, the, just, the civil servants, the reduction in churn within the civil service in terms of moving around to, to have your career, um, all of these elements have to come in place. And, and if you do come up with a policy that ends up killing people, I don't expect to see you back around in that same government or indeed a future one that there has to be some accountability. I was talking with a colleague of mine who's done some research on disability now. We're trying to get people moving. And, and the research that they came up with, the Activity Alliance, I think the organization is called. I've been a, a vice president of it for, for years and years. It just changed its name. That's why it was EFDS before. Um, and they came up with this research that said that 50% of, of these people with disabilities are afraid to do increased activity because they're, they're afraid they'll get their universal credit pool. And when you look at the unintended, how is that when 50% of a population, how is that an unintended consequence? Well, at how the very least, just to jump in, it would be a question that was not deemed worthy of asking when the policy was designed, which is often where, from my limited experience, the unintended consequences happen. It's because that wasn't deemed to be a factor at the time worth considering when something was designed and then later down the line it's implemented therefore it is too late to change something which is already running um i just want to quickly go to Catherine, and then i have one last question to wrap things off because i'm conscious that we could probably spend all day talking here. <laughs> so Catherine. yeah i just two points really one is just to sort of pick up on the points that have just been made and i think what i was really interested to see is you know thinking about this kind of 24-hour news cycle and thinking about like how quickly and responsive we can be is that you know trust in government you know I was looking at the OECD stats last night actually uh, and you know 43-47% of people trust their government you know and that's pretty low but then on the other hand you know the government is constantly polling throughout um, throughout COVID and, and is getting a, a weekly if not daily 
response in terms of you can track trust in government over kind of, you know, somebody announces something, it goes up, somebody does something else, it goes down. So it's almost, you know, that sense of kind of people either have trust in their government or don't have it, I think is long gone. I think we're in a, in a situation where, you know, as, as, as Matthew was saying about this kind of dynamic relationship between the leaders and the led, it's, it's much more um, responsive and, and dynamic than it used to be. And I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, but I think one of the things that we, you know, to, to build on the, the points that Ask has just been making, one of the things we're looking at, and I think, you know, we, we, we have a, a sort of end goal in sight of kind of having a psychological impact assessment, right? So, you know, when somebody sits down to, to produce a policy, and it's not as straightforward as that, obviously, but, you know, you have to do your um, sustainability impact assessment. You have to do your equality impact assessment. Do you also need to think about, you know, what it's going to do to people's, identity will it create stigma will it affect people's relationships you know there are some questions that we and it wouldn't be entirely you know we have evidence to say this it may be evidence-based principles which is you know where we may get to but there's certainly something that we can be doing to be helping those who you know and and i i'm, I'm potentially less cynical than than some but you know if if we are not saying any names john but you know <laughs> you know if if people are setting out to do the best job they can as a policymaker and you know some policymakers are given a brief you know on the monday and they're supposed to report on the friday and if we were able to provide them with something where they think help them to think through some of these unintended consequences from a psychological perspective you know again i think that could could do really good things in terms of policy outcomes it's part of the it's part of that jigsaw but i think it's a really important part right so just to wrap things up i'm gonna give you guys all a last chance to come in but one of the key themes that's really emerged is from my perspective it's trust but it's also trust that people can be engaged throughout the process whether it's deliberate democracy whether it's traditional policy making structures, that consultation or just following public signals isn't necessarily enough anymore. It's the, the way forward or one of the ways forward worth exploring now, whether it's psychology has one answer among many. And the answer I would say that it's not one answer that we're in the need for, we're in need of a toolkit because different problems will lead to different questions, will lead to different ways of figuring out the answers to those questions. Um, but the key theme here is that people are not just on the side, they're not just spectators, they're actually both consumers, recipients, and designers of policy. So how do we actually engage with these people throughout? Um, I'd like to go first to John in terms of closing thoughts in regards to, we are now faster than I would say anybody of us expected, returning back to whatever a new normal is, as the lockdown restrictions start opening up, as we start re basically putting the, few, the foundations for what a good society will look like for us in the next couple of years, if we decide to take on that window, um, what do you want to see in terms of a key underlying point of bringing people into policymaking? So I'm going to go to John first, <clears throat> and Catherine, and then we'll finish off with Matthew. I think if ever there was a point we could bring... Uh, a diverse cohort of voices into policy making it's now simply because <clears throat> we have a whole group of invisible citizens who are suddenly newly visible and not just visible but now they have a new name and that name is key all of a sudden the voices of people who i think might have been overlooked as too ignorant too too uninterested or too apathetic or too busy to be involved in in the machinations of the of, of our society we suddenly realize how important they are. And I, I hope that people realize there will be consequences for trying to make people who have become visible invisible again. And so some of these key workers are exactly the voices that we've always needed because they are exactly the proportion of people for whom policy disproportionately impacts. And so now is the time, I think, where there are a group of people who realize that if they had a say, perhaps they would be safer, perhaps the world would be better and would be more motivated, even, even with the other challenges that they may have, to be involved in the process. I suppose my, my concern is that we're still in a situation where good ideas are party political. Where a great idea, if it, I mean, it takes a generation maybe, but then it gets renamed and it's now a conservative idea. I think I've seen that with some policy, but 
I'm broadly, I don't, I think the system we have is so immature and the people who are in power are so intoxicated by that power that the idea of creating a system that distributes that, that power that, that in their mind weakens and in everybody else's mind strengthens the, 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 the decision-making process. I think they're going to be incredibly resistant to it. And I have no idea from a political perspective, how we make that impact. I know that the work that we're doing, um, Saskia and, and Catherine is, is trying to understand where psychology can have an impact. And part of that is in a mindset approach. Part of that is going to be in helping politicians in what Matthew has rightly described as a pretty miserable job. It, there's lots of areas we can, but I'm just not sure that people have an appetite for the, for the scope of change. They want a new normal. They want the same as before and throw a bone or a breadcrumb. And on that note, I'm passing it over to Catherine, who has a much more all-encompassing view than I have of the society. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think, I'm trying to, yeah, there's a lot to, <laughs> there's a lot for us to put together. But I think, you know, one of the things for me is as, we, as we're coming out of, of lockdown and, and you know, I, I think for me, my, my overarching message would be about, you know, start from the uncertainty. And I think that's where I think we can, if we can capture that sense from where we, um, from where we've been trying to, the, the, the speed of policy making over the last 10 weeks has just been so rapid and we've created so many unintended consequences and there's so many areas where we've not listened as well as we could or areas where we've sort of looked back with, you know, 2020 hindsight and thought, oh yeah, should have done that differently. But I think all of the, you know, the, the two things that bring that together for me is one that this is, you know, unprecedented. Um, you know, however you look at it. And I think that sense of it, the world is uncertain and we have to live with that and we have to start with that for me is really important. And then the second thing is this thing of, you know, we can talk about unintended consequences, but that sense of like an emotional response to policy making is something that we need to capture and we need to be really, needs to be really central. And that's something again, that's come out really strongly over the last couple of months is that, you know, policies create fear. Policies create trust. Policies can, you know, alleviate fear and, and can destroy trust. And I think that's something where, you know, it can mess with people's identities. It can mess with their family, you know. And those are all things where we don't have the answers. And, you know, to go back to my previous point about uncertainty, we can't predict what will happen. But we can certainly use some of that knowledge and some of that evidence that we do have to think about how we can, you know, have better outcomes, essentially. And um, before I give the last word to Matthew, I would also say that, to paraphrase, um, advisors advise, ministers decide. Psychology has evidence. It doesn't mean it's it should be prioritized to the extent of being responsible and making the decision. It's part of the picture. It's part of the decision. But ultimately, the decision will still remain within the hands of policymakers who decide to use it or not. Back to Matthew. Let me finish with a positive thought. Um, you know, I think since the Second World War, there have been three dominant systems. And at, and at the time that they were dominant, political systems, at the time that they were dominant, they were never universal. And they started to decay long before they collapsed. But nevertheless, we had the post-war settlement, which lasted for roughly 30 years from the end of the Second World War to the early 70s. We then go through the oil crisis and various other things, and we move into the period of neoliberalism. Uh, we then get to 2007, 2008, and we move into the period of populism. Now, as I say, every country is different, and history goes at different rates at different times. But I think that, Populism is not doing well in this crisis. You know, uh, whether it's Bolsonaro or Trump or Putin or Johnson and his kind of affable populism, nationalistic populism. And I wonder whether it will hasten the demise of populism. And I think the question then is, what is the system that replaces populism? What is the new political framework that emerges in a post-populist world? And I guess my challenge to psychologists is that 
there are some very simple insights um, which aren't truths with a capital T, but they are insights. They are things that we should bring into our conversations about how people respond, uh, you know, the idea that people's views change through, through discussion and engagement and interaction. There's no such thing as public opinion in any kind of useful sense. Uh, what really makes us happy, the things which seem to be the most important determinants of our contentment, um, the, the impact that poverty, inequality and prejudice has on people's psychology and their, and their scope for, 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 for flourishing, that if there is to be a new era, then psychology needs to get its shit together and it needs to be really clear about the things that it really, really wants leaders and society as a whole to bear in mind so that potentially the system that emerges after populism is actually a step forward for the human race and not as populism itself has been a step backwards. And on that, which is actually a wonderful positive note, but also a call to action, I think to both um, us and also what we're trying to get this program to, who hopefully in six months we'll be able to bring you back and have a more in-depth conversation where we'll actually have touched upon these things a bit further, but it's also a call to action to our members, I would say, to anyone who's actually working, whether it's with the BPS, with the community, bring their own patient prices to actually take a thing and take a step forward on actually what does that new framework look like and where does the evidence of a training go for, to, in order to not just speak for yourself, but to actually help other people speak for themselves, which I think is more important because we don't want to just speak for others. Um, so on that note, thank you very much to Catherine, John, Matthew for joining us today. Um, for everyone who joined us in the audience, thank you again. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good thank day. You. Bye.